How did Bill Glasgow find David French? Oh, I wish I could remember. There's a beautiful story about um, finding David. It was a match made in heaven. It was really, really I mean, they, they, they clicked immediately. They were a couple. Mm, yeah. They ended yeah. up looking like yeah. a couple and yeah. acting like a couple. Yeah. And David came to every rehearsal. He would come to every performance in, that, in those days, and then he'd just pace in the lobby, <laughs> listening through the door, because, of course, there's no place to stand. Uh, he, was, he, he, was, he was amazing. And how much dramaturge work did Bill do on David's scripts? Probably not a lot, but, but I, 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 think he, I think he certainly read everything and, and discussed it with him. David's a, f I think, I am not wrong, he's a fairly firm in his opinions about his own writing. And he seems to be right in the most, most cases. Mm -hmm. Certainly that, that trilogy was, was such a good thing. Um, and the trilogy about the Mercer family, mm, the, the, mm. the Mercer place. I guess there's more than five, more than three yeah, actually, aren't there? Five, yeah, five, yeah. Uh, did Bill understand where David was going? I think so. Creating that I think body so. Of I think they really, they really did connect, and they understood each other. And it was that, that again, it was that kind of support that he gave him, which was so important. You and John Gilbert came out from the states. Yes. In reaction to the Vietnam War. We'd like to say we were draft dodgers. Were you? <laughs> well, we certainly, we were living in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, a, and John was at Brown. And so you were in a little, you were in a small town with uh, really lots of faculty dinners. And after a while that begins to pall. Now, the interesting thing about it was that I had been working part-time at Trinity Square Theater, which is now one of the major regionals. And I think if I had stayed in Providence, I would, that would have become my tarragon, because it was a very interesting theater run by a man called Adrian Hall. And uh, it had the same kind of uh, family feeling. I went back to, to Providence within the last uh, five years when Edgar Doby was the general manager. And uh, I walked into a meeting, and there were some of the people who had been there when I was there, like. 25 years before, I thought, wow, it, it hasn't changed. I mean, it's a much bigger theater, and it, it, it really grew, and it, it, it does a lot of new work, but it does a lot of other things as well. But it, it, the town had begun to sort of get too small for us. And so when he had an opportunity, right. his, his advisor, his thesis advisor, had I either come from Canada or knew the university very well. So recommended it, and we both came up here. And the thing I'm interested in is also the, the because it, being an American is a very full sense of identity. You're right. And I lived in Detroit. I'd never heard of Toronto. And I, you know, I was like across the river from, from Windsor. And we'd taken a couple of vacations uh, driving through Canada, but uh, I knew nothing about Toronto. And I remember, but I do remember after a few months sitting in a room with a number of other people and having an American woman say that she wouldn't go out at night and walk the streets and, and sort of getting really annoyed at her and saying, you know, this is not the States. You know, don't start doing this, or or else we're all going to be instilling fear in each other. Uh, and I, I, I was so, I was so pissed off there. I thought, here you are, you're in a new, new country. Don't start importing all of this fear. And I mean, that was back in the late '60s. But to land here in the early '70s, then, and see these Canadians, mm. who you didn't know a lot about decide they want a theater that had Canadian writers and there weren't any Canadian writers. What was that like? Well, it was a, it was a little, there was a bit more because when I first arrived, uh, I knew somebody across the street who introduced me to the Women's Alumni Theater, 
which is the fire hall downtown. <coughs> and they were doing the avant-garde work then. They were doing Little Malcolm and his struggle with the eunuchs and Viet Rock and all these things that, um, and the classics. And your mom was there. And uh, it was what introduced me to all of these people. It introduced me to Erjo, because I, I, I produced one of his shows. Um, introduced me to Bill, and I eventually sort of helped out on a, a show f with Bill at, in 1968. So I, m I met all these people at first, which was the best part about it. I, w I felt like when I s slid into Tarragon, uh, it, was, it was just a, a clear line from... But you picked up someone else's cause, Canadian writing. Oh yeah, well that's easy. How is that <laughs> I easy? can do that. I can do that. I live with. I lived with an Englishman, uh, you know, and who who taught French, and you know, you, you get, you just sort of. No, I I I can, you I can understand. Thirty-two it. years at the most quintessential Canadian theater. Thirty-four. Thirty-four <laughs> years at the most quintessential <laughs> Canadian theater about Canadian writing yeah. for Canadian yeah. audiences, and yet you came from the United States. Yeah. It took me a long. It took me a while to be. Uh, now I've been here longer than I w lived in the states. Now you never you never lose what you had in the beginning, in the, your early formative years, but oh, I I have I have always felt very strongly about it. I mean, I you can if people around you are passionate about a cause, it's very easy to become passionate about it, unless you really disagree. Tell me about boards. Boards boards are really interesting. Um, in the way of Bill Glasgow, we really never had an official board. We had the 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 sort of the the the, the absolute minimum. We had three people, and it was Jane, Bill, and their next door neighbor. And then it was Jane, Bill, and and Bill Graham. And it was only, but he had an advisory board, who actually acted like a board. And they were all his friends. And of course, Bill had some interesting friends. So we had lots of lovely people on our board. Anna Porter and, uh, you know, we had Stephen Clarkson. We had, uh, we had Murray Frum. We had, oh, it just went down the list. We had the, a couple of Jackmans. Uh, <laughs> it, it, was, it was a board of very well-heeled, well-placed people uh, who were only asked, really, to affirm <laughs> Bill's, Bill's vision. And were they there for money? Or they, they could help, uh, at, yes, and some did. Phil Gray was, the, was just a prince. He was, Philip Gray was the first person who, who he owned a lot of property downtown. He was the first person to, to lease it and rent it to people who didn't have money, like artists. And he sort of started a whole kind of um, trend in that direction of people who had things letting other people use it at a much reduced rate. Um, so yes, they did. They did help us. If we needed, a, if we needed a credit, we, we could borrow from them at no interest. So, I mean, the things like that were, were really important. They could raise money for us. I want to ask how boards influence theaters. In terms of board is chosen, hopefully, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by its own board members and, and the staff. But at the same time, I have witnessed, I do believe, in the 80s, the boards starting to lean and form or influence the artistic vision of a theater. And in my eyes, the reason for that is that the person running that theater, the artistic head of that theater, does not take his own or her own job seriously and, and make it apparent who, who holds the vision and who is the leader of the company. I hear, it makes me so angry. I hear people say, well, I have to, uh, I have to get approval from the board or I can't do this without the board saying yes. It, it, it can't work like that. It, the board is there to support the vision of, of 
whoever's leading that organization. And if they don't start out with that view, or if they, if they suddenly become uh, employed by the board, people, people will use that term, and it's just it's so wrong. So is this in the bylaws of the board? No, this no, I don't, I don't think it is. I, I mean, I think there are people who, I think there are board members who get it into their head that that is what their function is. And there are, unfortunately, people who run organizations who still think that they're, they're overseen by, by a board. I mean, if that person wasn't there, there'd be nothing for the board to do. So how does an artistic director then reaffirm by, by by being strong and by by literally asking for people's buy-in and for their support and and taking care to keep the board informed and to, to consult with them or to collaborate with them or whatever you want to say but it's it's that person's vision that's running the organization I mean it can't be otherwise I don't think, unless it's a municipal building. I mean, I suppose there are places where a board of directors forms itself and creates, they, they, they buy a building, they build, they build a building, and then they go looking for someone to run it. Well, then you might as well call them a manager. If you're, if you're going to be the, the last word on what is done in, in a place, then it's a completely different kind and the of... Have been changing yeah, to yeah, artistic yeah. producer yeah. and soon yeah. artistic. Mm. Yeah. Not something that Mallory yeah. No, no. 